Okay. Thank you, Doug and Mahalani for that introduction. So yes, as I mentioned, my name is Keith Kamikaw. I'm a PhD candidate in Marine Biology graduate program. And for my talk today, I'm going to be speaking to you about bonefishes here in Hawaii. But before I actually did that, I wanted to just put in a, a short a plug here. So I, I do my PhD dissertation, I'd say, on the side. My full-time day-to-day job is at, as a fisheries extension agent on contract um, with Linker at NOAA. There's the, I'm on the Pacific Island Regional Office side. It's that really large building at Ford Island. And then the other half of our building is the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center. And so my, my official title at NOAA is fisheries extension agent. And so that's basically being a middleman or a interface, catalyst, liaison. There's a lot of different words that kind of describe some of the work I do. But basically I work with three main stakeholders here, the scientific fishing and management community. And so that can kind of manifest itself in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes I do education and outreach, or sometimes I'm reviewing grants or helping the scientific community on research projects or connecting them to fishermen. It's, it's a bunch of different things. And so one little project that I'm working on that's actually somewhat related to my talk today is that I'm building some outreach materials and helping some elementary schools with curriculum development, specifically in marine science, where I'm actually trying to preserve different parts of fishes, mainly their jaws and skulls. So does anybody know what happens or what this happens to be? I heard a ray, that's actually, that's kind of close. Anyway, so these, this is on the left. This is actually the, the roof of the mouth of a bonefish. And this is kind of, I call it its tongue, but it's not really its tongue. And I, they are basically, these little things are like these, they're basically like teeth. But so bonefish, they don't have sharp teeth like a, a barracuda or something like that. They have these plates where they crush. So that would kind of tell you what they eat, right? If it's got crushing plates, maybe eat something that's hard, like crabs. And so these are just kind of one of the little tools I'm trying to, when we have a kind of education and outreach with the keiki, kind of show them something and you have them link what they're seeing to natural phenomena. And so I've got some all different types of heads and jaws and I'm getting some donations from other divers and boat fishermen. So ideally I'll have a pretty, pretty interesting collection. So it should look, I don't know how long it'll take and it's going to probably smell. Um, working with the Bishop Museum, they have these dermistid beetles that eat the flesh away off of bones. Some people told me it's similar to some of the crime shows and things like that, but we're gonna try and do that on the balcony of my apartment. So, but to kind of just flip gears back to my talk. So as you saw earlier, the title of my talk is about basically connecting the dots for bonefishes from, you know, from when they're born to wherever they end up, whether that's on the fisherman's hook or on the dinner plate. And so here we have two species of bonefish. One is the round jaw, that's its common name. And as you can see, it actually, when you flip it upside down, you'll see that it has a rounded jaw. And this one is located, it's an Indo-Pacific one, so Southern Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And this is the sharp jaw. And it's, it's really subtle, but the bottom of its jaw is pointed. But usually the more prominent distinguishing feature is this yellow dot here under its pectoral fin. And when you look at them in the water, they do look a little different. The sharp jaws are often a little more slender, sleek. They don't look as green in the water as our round jaws. And the sharp jaws are typically in the deeper water. So these are the ones you find in the channels offshore. And the round jaws are the ones that are almost exclusively caught on our shallow, flat, shallow flats. So like in Manolua Bay, if you're in two feet of water and you see a bonefish, it's almost guaranteed going to be a round jaw. They, they, they segregate by habitat um, pretty well. Um, there's times where they mix, but that's, there's always, there's always ex exceptions. So what makes bonefishes unique here is that they're targeted 
in different types of habitat, but a wide variety of gears. So if any of you are familiar, they often call Florida is the bonefish capital where they have a multi-million dollar fly fishing industry where people go out on boats, they have guides and they fly fish for, they have Albula volpes there. Well, they have a couple other ones, but that's the one on their shallow flats, but it's almost exclusively in shallow water. But here we target them in different places, right? The most common one is perhaps shark casting from the beach. Um, of course, this is not a picture of Sand Island. Let's give it away. Um, we also have deeper channels. So people are targeting them off of boats or off of kayaks. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we still do have the shallow flats. As you can see, shallow water, and these are going to be our round jaws. <clears throat> So that's what that's definitely one of the aspects that makes the fishery for bonefishes here unique, where it's not just catch and release or people eating them or one type uh, gear type. It's a it's a bit more complicated. And this is something I I usually put in the presentation, but I have you take it uh, with a grain of salt. So this is commercial data from one of Alan Freelander's papers, but basically the main message here is to show that. If you look at the commercial landings over time, it is declining or has declined. I don't want you to kind of get into a, a mindset of there aren't any bonefish, they're gone, we've ate them all or fished them all out. There's still a lot of bonefish out there. It's just the the fishery is different. And I'll touch, in, touch on that in a little bit throughout this presentation. Or if I don't, uh, please feel free to, to ask me. And so as, as I progress throughout this presentation, again, as, a, as I mentioned, this is my PhD work, but feel free to ask me any questions or any clarifying things. It'll be a relatively short presentation. So there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. But what I have here is a basic schematic of what we'd like to know about a fish in general. So a fish that is either targeted for, you know, non-commercial recreational purposes, or even if it's by the commercial fishery or, you know, for profit, we'd like to know maybe when spawning occurs, that's kind of represented here with the eggs, where, where the larvae go, how fast do they grow, what habitat do they use? Same thing with the juveniles and like adults, you know, what do they, what do they eat? Where do they, how far do they travel? Basically all the different characteristics at different life stages. And for some fish, it might be the same between juveniles and adults. But oftentimes there's, there's what we call like an ontogenetic shift. There's something that occurs in between these different life stages that makes the next one different. And then of course, I have this here as, as capture, but I will, that will become more clear as the pre presentation progresses as well. So if that was what we'd like to know, I often like to say that the size of these bubbles are what we knew just a handful of years ago. We knew very little about these two species that are, you know, highly targeted by different free trees and we like to eat them, we like to catch them, but we actually really didn't know much about them. And so from that came about, or one of the reasons why an eel tagging project or a bonefish tagging project came about. And I was actually here almost I guess four years ago, it was like 2015, and I gave a presentation about the OEO tagging project, which I was the coordinator of at the time. It's basically where we gave out tagging kits to people, where they would get an applicator like this, and then these hall print tags, that would say OEO tagging project, have a specific number, and actually uh, our phone number on it. And the idea was that anybody going for a bonefish Let's just say they caught one, they put it in their cooler, and they got lucky, caught another one, and they didn't need to take that other one home for food or something, they could tag it. So it also increased the conservation ethic for these species, but also was a really great citizen science project. And so there was several thousand of these fishes tagged with these dart tags. And the idea is that, you know, you tag one today, someone else catches it later. And with that, you can find out what habitats these fish are using and how much they grew between tagging times. So when you first tag it, you measure it, you let it go, someone else catches it. They call us in with that number and they tell us how long it is and you can kind of model growth off of that. So with 
after this project happened, we were able to get more information. It wasn't perfect. Again, if these the sizes of these bubbles represented, you know, what we wanted to know about these species, we found a little bit about spawning. Through this project, we were able to get some samples. Fishermen donated the, um, the guts and the heads of fishes so that we could get the gonads to figure out when fish are spawning. And they'd also give us the heads. Um, that would probably be a whole nother talk, but some of you may be familiar with the otoliths in a fish's head. They're these ear bones. They grow along with the fish. But basically, if you take them out and section them, I'll have a picture later, they have rings on it, just like the rings on a tree. And we can count how old a fish actually is. So that's why this, this adult bubble was a lot bigger. So we didn't really know a lot about these other life stages, but we did figure a good amount about the adult life stage. <clears throat> so this is kind of just a brief kind of bird's eye view of what we learned from the tagging project. Well, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of habitat, you know, the round jaws were often in the shallow areas, sharp jaws were in the deep, but they also had extremely high site fidelity, meaning, especially for the round jaws, I had one fish that I caught, and then 11 days later, it was caught in the same place, but oftentimes, somewhere caught four years later in the same place. So obviously, we don't know what they're doing in between, but they're coming to the same place you know, every day to feed. So they had a really high site fidelity. That's what that means. And in terms of spawning, as I mentioned, we collaborated with a lot of fishermen and tournaments where we got a lot of the gonad and gut samples. And we were able to find out that, you know, general spawning season was in the winter months with some variation. And this L50 represents the length at which 50% of the fish are capable to spawn or able to spawn. So let's just say we caught a hundred, a hundred bonefish. The ones that are kind of in this range here, in general, fifty percent of them are spawning capable. So after the after this size, you know they're probably typically spawning on the the lunar cycle. And as I mentioned, we with the guts, we also did a somewhat of a a diet analysis. We found out they're benthic feeders, as I mentioned. It was perhaps easy to guess based on the morphology of the fish and their jaw structure. But what was more interesting that I can share later is that it was pretty different between species. So not only are these two species living in different habitats, but they are eating different things. And then we're also finding out that these fish are getting pretty old. So once they're over 10 pounds, like the 10 to 12 pound range, these fish are actually teenagers. So if you can imagine, you know, they're, they're pretty old for uh, a near shore fish species. So what I wanted to do is I still wanted to work with bone fishes just because I, I enjoy fishing for them. And I was, that's what I was doing during my master's work. So for my dissertation, what I wanted to do is start to fill in some of those gaps that we have. And typically you have three chapters. So my first chapter was going to be focused on the, the larvae and opportunistically, I was able to learn some things about the juveniles. And my chapter two, I wanted to do some population genetics, which is something I'm still definitely learning, but that will give us an idea of basically what true range some of these adults have. And then the third chapter was actually something pretty different where I was gonna take a kind of social science approach to it where I am going to do or have been doing some surveys and interviews where I actually talk to the fishermen and people in the industry and understand their attitudes and preferences about these fishes so that ideally we can kind of get a better holistic picture of the full life cycle of bonefish here in Hawaii. So my first chapter is about the leptocephalus. So that's what we call the larval stage of bonefish and eels tarpon and ladyfish also have this leptocephalus stage and they're typically caught through either stationary nets and flats or beach seining and things like that but the way i decided to do it and some others have is through light traps so this is something i ended up just building with some tri couple of trips to city mill and home depot but the the basic idea is you know at night your patio if you hang something to attract the moths and mosquitoes it's pretty much the same concept but underwater 
A lot of critters and organisms are phototactic. They're attracted to the light. I don't truly, or I don't know if we truly understand all those exact mechanisms because it varies um, by different stage and species. But the idea is that I have a light hanging in this bucket and there's these funnels I epoxy kind of backwards inverted into here and I leave it out in the water. So this is in Pico Lagoon. I received special activity permit from Division of Aquatic Resources, number one, to use the trap, and then from Dofal uh, Fisheries and Wildlife to actually go into Pico Lagoon to use these traps. And I go out at night, and then this is just a PVC end that I can unscrew so that when I pull the trap out of the water, I can actually see everything swimming inside of it. And the thing was, I was told to maybe not do bonefish because we didn't know where their larvae were. And so that was kind of the more exciting part where I, at one point was kind of just putting my traps all over the place, just really throwing things in the dark, trying to find them. But some of the literature suggests that, you know, near shore, calm areas and potentially fresh water supply is one of these areas that the larvae are queuing in on. So that's kind of where I ended up. And luckily I was able to catch some. So this here is one of the kind of freshly transformed or metamorphosed bonefishes. I'm not sure how to say that word. I've only caught four of them, but I wasn't expecting to catch any. And this is 25 millimeters long. So if you can imagine how small that actually is, it's, it's pretty small. And these are the leptocephalus. So if you can believe it or not, this, you know, in several months, is gonna turn into a bonefish. And for tarpon and eels, they have this similar larval stage. It looks a little different. Some of them are like kind of more round and bulbous looking, but it's it's really hard. These the pictures don't don't do it justice, but the they are really flat and completely transparent. So really in the water, at most you'll just see their eyes kind of moving around and they they swim like eels. But it's another kind of trippy thing is if you can see here, the average fork length I have for these is, you know, five, six centimeters. Whereas when it turns into a fish, it's a lot smaller. So actually from an egg, they grow up, they get bigger. And then over time, they actually shrink back down and turn into a fish. So they're, well, they're one of the few species that actually reach the same length three times in their life. Right? They go from an egg, get bigger hit a max size around 60, 70 millimeters or so, shrink back down as they're undergoing all these crazy chemical and physical changes, and then come out as a fish like that. And then um, I'm thinking right now, these are maybe third, uh, a couple months old. So this is just a little bit older. And then as I said, right, we know they can grow up to be at least 15, 16 years old. So they have a pretty crazy life cycle. Oh, yeah, so these, these are the, I had a friend that was a little, pretty handy. He made me this plexiglass kind of viewing container. So when I catch them, I'd put them in here. But even just, you know, the kind of sediment and water partic uh, particles in the water make it not truly what it actually looks like. They are really, really transparent. Um, but you can, you'll be able to see, well, let me use this picture. These kind of V-shaped lines are their myomeres, kind of their muscle segments. So actually, if you count these, we can tell whether they're the round jaw or the sharp jaw. And then, yeah, they basically are really transparent, have a forked tail, which is pretty distinct. You can see they have like a dorsal fin here. Over time, these things all shift. They tiny little pectoral fins up here. And actually when they're really small, they have teeth that look really crazy, like sharp and stuff, but they're not, you know, they're not sharp. So that's another thing. We don't really know what they eat. They have this really thin intestines that runs down the bottom of the body. So anyway, this is just kind of like stuff we didn't really know before. So the things I'm trying to collect are, you know, salinity and temperature and location, and at least figure out which habitats are really important for these fish. And then in the future is going to be removing their otoliths, those ear bones I was mentioning. So this is a really intensely magnified picture of their otolith. Bonefishes, when they get really big, their otolith is like the size of a dime. 
which for fishes is actually really, really big. For like a thousand pound marlin, their otoliths are tiny. It's like a Sharpie dot, really, really small. So it varies between species. But for these, I actually need to put the, the leptocephalus under a microscope and use sewing needles to get the otolith mm -hmm. out because you can't see it with your naked eye. So by the time my dissertation's over, I'll probably need glasses or contacts <laughs> or, or something because everything is really small when you're working with uh, larval fish. So that's, that's kind of my chapter one. And then my chapter two is kind of completely shifting gears. But this was a kind of collaborative effort I did with some fishermen around the state and in other regions. But the idea was to collect some fin clips in an effort to figure out their kind of population genetics or what their different distribution. So I mentioned the round jaw of Bula glossodona. We know they're in the Indian Ocean and Southern Pacific, but we just, we don't really know, are these fishes swimming, you know, really far or is it their larval stage that's transporting them? So those leptocephalus I was showing you earlier, in other studies, like in Palmyra and in Florida, Bahamas, they spend about a couple months in the pelagic, meaning they're swimming out in the open ocean, kind of in the deep blue for a couple months. So this could allow them to, you know, get in between islands within the state or perhaps even further. So that is one side of it, but we also know that these fish have really extreme site fidelity, right? They're pretty much showing up in the same place every day to feed. So it's kind of, in my mind, two contradicting things. So it'd be just interesting to see if the same species of round jaw here are related to the round jaws in Christmas Island or French Polynesia mm -hmm. or in the Indian Ocean. So I've got a bunch of fin, fin clips from around Oahu, I had volunteer anglers going out and you just take a little piece of their fin, um, it goes into this ethanol or DMSO, just a preservative solution. And it's, it's pretty funny that I've actually caught, I've caught a fish, took a fin clip and caught it a week later. And the, the fin grows back relatively quickly. Um, so I know some people are kind of often worry about that. Like, oh, you're cutting a fish, but it, it does grow back. And I've actually caught one that I've clipped like a week before. So this, this is kind of the plan. This is the chapter I've probably done the least with so far. But the idea is to kind of match it, again, as I mentioned, to their, their site fidelity. So this is, this is a figure that came out of the EO tagging project. This is actually something I've already just mentioned. Every dot here is a, a recaptured bonefish. So what this is basically showing you, there's a lot of dots just along the bottom, but about 80, 85% of the recaptured bonefish are caught within less than a kilometer of their original tagging location. So like from Honolulu Bay, there's fish that are tagged at Pico and then four years later caught at Kauai Kui or something like that. And there are a handful, which are often the sharp jaws that make these bigger movements. And these are the ones, as I mentioned, that live in the deeper waters. So we know that the adults move sometimes but are often more often than not kind of staying in the same area but we know that the larvae have a really really wide distribution and this is taken from uh, Colburn et al from 2001 and the tricky thing about bonefishes is that they're kind of I guess I'm not sure how to phrase it but they're kind of genetic distribution, the population genetics is constantly being revised. We're finding out that, so this is, this is actually a little old, that these species are, have been uh, given names. As I mentioned, this Vergata, it was thought it was in other places, but now it's um, said to be endemic to Hawaii, meaning it's found nowhere else in the world except for here in this state. And there's a black triangle here. Of course, I made the background black. But so the Glossodonna, right, we have them here in Hawaii, but we know that they're in the, the South Pacific and in the Indian Ocean as well. So the idea is that if I can kind of tease out the kind of genetic makeup of the round jaws that we have here, you can compare it to things in a database here, here, and here. And 
basically it's it's uh, one of those tricky things that still has been changing there's still some uncertainty but hopefully just some basic fin clips will be able to shed some light on where these fish are actually going and the reason i guess this matters is that folks in like florida and the gulf of mexico they'll tag and track tarpon and they'll have maybe rules and regulations for them in florida but they're finding out that these tarpon travel all over the place and they're living in different habitats or different life stages. So if they're protected in one place, grow up and move to another place where you can catch, take and eat any size, any time of the year, well then that might potentially make the management, you know, in Florida ineffective. So long story short, it would be nice to know if, you know, the, the bonefish we have here are ours, they're, you know, Hawaiian bonefish, or they actually, kind of being shared throughout a wider area. And the same questions kind of pop up for our tuna fisheries, right? It's like, do we have resident stocks or do we have ones that mix in different parts of the, the Pacific Ocean? So now for, for the last chapter, uh, at the end, I'll kind of show you how all these things piece together. It kind of these three, three chapters on their own seem a little bit hodgepodge, but I assure you at the end, it kind of all pieces together. So for my third chapter, as I mentioned, I kind of wanted to take the socioeconomic approach and I wanted to just kind of figure out basically track of fish. You know, they, people talk about the farm to table, ocean to table kind of thing. And I wanted to do something similar for bonefish. So for bonefish this year, we do have a commercial fishery. It's a little bit smaller than it used to be. I think a lot of it in part is there's just less demand for it, but our non-commercial fishery for them is, is pretty big. And so for the commercial fishery, I can get that information through data requests. And then for the non-commercial side, I will do it through interviews and surveys. And so I've started this, this aspect of the project so far. But this is, so the, the commercial side is, is pretty, I don't wanna call it linear, but you know, there's commercial fishermen that catch bonefish, you know, that stuff moves to certain markets and stuff. It's a relatively simple chain compared to what I presume the non-commercial fishery to be like. So here it's, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, we target them through with different gear types, partially because they also live in different habitats. So we have shore casters. There's even some people that spear them. There's still people that net them. And then of course we do have a small but growing fly fishing industry as well. And from that, well, I wanna figure out their different motivations on whether they keep it or they release it. So shore casters, you know, they can, they can keep a release. Spear fishermen, typically, you know, if you put a hole in a fish, you keep it, it's hard to release. Net fishermen are often keeping as well. And fly fishing is almost predominantly a, a catch and release fishery. So those are the kind of different um, motivations of why people are targeting these fish. Some of them are doing it for food, right? If you're keeping it, it's for food. And then if you're releasing it, some people are doing it for sport or for citizen science, as I mentioned, for tagging project. So the OEO tagging project is currently not active, but the Pacific Island Fisheries Group, they have a tag it project where they have a universal tag and you can tag papil, oil, barracuda, moi, kahala. You can, they have a wide range of species you can tag with one same tag. So if someone catches that fish, they kind of keep a database of a bunch of different species. And then there's another level after keeping for, in terms of the food category. You know, some people are either keeping it for themselves, is it for their friends or family? Is there a traditional or cultural significance? Is it for weddings, ceremonies, birthdays, you know, that type of thing. So from the time uh, a fish is caught, there's a different avenues basically you can take, whether it you know, ends up as being food or back out in the ocean to be caught by someone else. So if we kind of wrap back to kind of this original generalized schematic of the, a fish's life cycle, there are these different, different chapters. I'm starting to learn about their, their larval stage and eventually how old they are. And as, if you can imagine, if I know exactly how old 
this larvae is in days. It's often days old. Each that picture I showed earlier, each ring is typically a day. They call them dailies. They get really big, turns into annuli. So each ring is a year. But let's just say this larvae is, you know, 60 days old. Then I know when it was born and I know when spawning occurred. And then you can kind of start really piecing together the picture of are they doing it on the new moon, full moon, you know, that type of thing. And then just opportunistically, I didn't know I was going to catch the, the juveniles, but I am kind of figuring out a little bit about bees as well. And then I am going to match that in. I've luckily through other organizations got some samples of the, the juvenile bonefish, whether, you know, the size of your hand like this. And we also had another project where we were doing beach seining in different areas on the windward side of Oahu. So you can do the same thing if you get a length, take out the otoliths out of these guys, figure out how old they are. You can really start to just piece together their growth and different parts of their life cycle. And then as we move on to the adults, you know, I just want to figure out sometimes, you know, what people are catching, how much they're catching and, and why. And sometimes the why is for tagging. You know, some of these people are catching bonefish and tagging them. They're doing it purely for sport. Some people are eating them. There's a lot of different ways now that people are actually consuming bonefish. One of the common methods is fish cake, where it might look something like this picture here, um, where they you know, mix things with the meat, cover it in panko or something, fry it up, or they put it in a wonton wrapper or one of these kind of gyoza wrapper type things, and you make little dumplings out of them, or people still have it raw, whether it's lomi o eel, or it's kind of like a poi paste-ish type of consistency. So in the end, through the tagging project and hopefully some of my dissertation work, we'll at least be able to figure out you know, where these fish are, what habitat they're using, and kind of piece together more aspects of their different life history. And so that is all I have for the, the formal I guess presentation. One of the things that I guess like to throw in at the end is that you know people always ask, so what? You know, why why is this work important? Why are you doing it? You know, of course I'm I'm having fun doing it, but I think this type of information can be important for different ways. Sometimes, and I'm I'm a fisherman too, sometimes fishermen are really wary creatures, right? Um, maybe management says we're gonna make a new regulation. And through maybe the, the socioeconomics aspect of this, this work, we can figure out maybe how many people it's going to affect and would that make sense? Like if we're going to raise the minimum size of bonefish here in the state. One of the questions in my survey is actually asking people, you know, what size do you want to do you keep a bonefish? Because some people don't like to keep a small one because for these fish, you can't actually fillet it like you would like a, a tuna or something. You, you scrape the meat out and then you make the patties or fish cakes you know, with it. So some people like to wait till they're actually bigger. So what if, you know, raising the minimum size to that L50 I talked about earlier, that spawning size actually isn't going to affect anyone. Or maybe it really does because people prefer a fish at a certain size. So it's not I always like to just kind of throw that in there that this this information is not to just create rules and regulations, but it's in turn to just be responsible scientific data that can be used on both sides. So with that, I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Any questions for Casey? Is Sigitara Not that I know of, because the Sigurtera, I used to know its life cycle relatively well. You know, originates as a diatom, ends up on algae. Herbivores eat the algae. Big predators eat the little fish, herbivores. But bonefish are kind of more sticking to crustaceans. Um, I think I have another slide after this. I can show the, the diet figure that we found throughout the tagging project. But I haven't heard of Sigurtera being a problem. And the Department of Health used to also keep a record of which fish were associated with secretary poisonings of people that ended up in the hospital and 
it's almost exclusively herbivore type fish. Uh, sure. The brown jaws, at least, apparently spawn inside the lagoon. Does that mean from the winter you see a lot of bone fishing inside the lagoon? Um, when you say lagoon, what, what exactly do you mean? Oh, oh, good question. So we, I'm sure some fishermen have seen it, but in general, we don't exactly know where they spawn. So they've actually, you can go on YouTube. So I, I should have mentioned earlier, Bonefish Tarpon Trust based in Florida helped sponsor some of my, my research that I've done here, but they finally were able to track some of the spawning aggregations. The idea is that they, they school up and they move way offshore. So these fish are broadcast spawners. And the idea is that um, you've probably maybe seen it on planet Earth, like the surgery fish, they, they dart up, some shoot out, you know, spray around the ones shoot out the eggs, it all mixes together, and those fertilized eggs go out into the open ocean. So the same thing happens with bonefish. So that hatches out somewhere in the open ocean, and those larvae make their way back in. So those, these leptos I'm catching are making their way back in from the open ocean. So yes, pretty. So those aggregations, I know some divers have seen aggregations on the edge of Mauna Loa Bay, but those are likely the pre-spawning aggregations before moving pretty far out. It's, I have one other that I want to talk Leptocephalus is twice as long. Is it heavy enough that maybe it's absorbing itself to turn into a juvenile? That in the... I'll be honest, I don't know the exact process, but it's made out of a, a glycan amino kind of compound. It looks, um, it looks like it should be really soft, but they're quite rigid. When you hold them on the hand, they actually flop around, kind of feel like a regular fish. But yeah, they basically kind of go through this metamorphosis process and it's a chemical kind of change where they go through like ossification where they're kind of uptaking calcium and kind of turning mm -hmm. things in the bones and less into that from that gelatinous material. Hopefully that answers a little bit of your question. <laughs> yeah. I was just writing one of the earlier slides, you have a commercial landing graph mm -hmm. that said that it's lower now than it has been the past. You mentioned you <coughs> discussed why that is, is it just there are fewer commercial fishermen in the fish or I don't know exactly for sure, but I think there is a, a I think it's probably a, a bunch of different things. One, the demand could be lower. And if the demand is low, people aren't going to catch it because they won't make a profit. Secondly, I've told there's an alternative to making fish cake here, uh, something else they're using besides, you know, Ho'i's bonefish. Um, and it's just not a, a species you typically will like see in the, I mean, you'll see them in, in Chinatown or Tamashiro's or something like that, but it's just not a, a fish with, with high demand. But what I meant by taking it a grain of salt is sometimes people see the commercial landings for Olua and think, you know, okay, the fishery has crashed. Of course, things are different than they were decades ago, but some of those things have coincided, like as the gentleman mentioned earlier with Sigaterra, and, you know, there's less of a demand for big alua. People aren't necessarily eating those big fish. So I think there's still a, a good amount of bonefish out there. It's just there's the commercial fishery dynamics have just changed. Yeah. Yes. Do they change sex at all? These ones do not. What's the method that commercial fishermen use to catch bonefish? Uh, right now, I believe it's still predominantly with a net. Yeah, that some of the data should be available online publicly in, on DARS, the Division of Aquatic Resources site. Yeah. I have two questions that are probably related. And that is, when you put your light trap out, you've got 200 plus of the longer phase, right? And you only got four of the the shorter ones with mm -hmm. a shrub factor. There's more like 40, I think, leptocephalus. I thought the one was just four. You said there were only four. Oh, yeah, four four of the juveniles and then about 40 of the, the leptos. Oh, I thought it was over 200. Um, I could have put a wrong number, which I would feel very bad about. Um, I think that might have been the minimum. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 41. Okay, my question is, 
Are these were caught, I guess, in the same trap area, the same area? Um, I guess, yeah, I didn't mention that. So one of the my two main locations, one was Pico Lagoon, and the other one was Hea Fish Pond. They allowed me to go in at night and place traps inside the actual pond. These two locations I chose uh, calm water, sheltered, freshwater input, but also I'm also doing these things at night by myself in the middle of the night. Yeah. So I kind of wanted places that restricted access of other people. So, and I didn't want to be bothering fishermen as well. Right. So, The larger question was, okay, to a non-ichthyologist, the, the little one on the left looks yes. more like a fish. Right. Okay, so my understanding is that they're in a sense two juvenile faces, right? This one on the right and the one on the left. Yes. When, you, when a juvenile becomes a non-juvenile adult, that might be defined by sexual maturity. I don't know how you define it. Like, you know, when is it not a juvenile anymore? But anyway, mm -hmm. my question is, what do you think the evolutionary advantage is to having, in a sense, metamorphosis? What's the advantage of having two different uh, larval, if that's the right word to use? Right. Know? Yeah, for a lot of, a lot of, uh, even crustaceans, you know, their larval stage. So for, for some fishes, yeah, the larval stage looks really different. A lot of it is due to, as I mentioned, so these these are transparent. So I was once told if you catch one of these, it was maybe like a hundred of these that had to come through because there's often a lot of mortality associated with being, you know, small. And there, a lot of larvae are clear and transparent. And that's why a lot of them often move at night to avoid predators so that they don't they don't get eaten. And this allows them to not use a lot of energy to kind of travel far distances. You know, they, they can swim on their own. They're not completely passive particles like some other uh, larval species. These can swim on their own. But, you know, this this surface area here allows them to kind of absorb different things. But, yeah, avoid predation and kind of um, yeah, a lot of it being transparent is to avoid being eaten. So, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. No, so, yeah, yeah. Well, why not just make a transparent one like the one on the left? Or is it because Good of the classification of the bone and everything that if it gives it, it gives it more opaqueness if it becomes more like a fish, whereas the ones on the right are sort of going to look like fish. Right, so, right. So maybe they don't need the same structures that would give it. Yeah. That's what you're trying to say. I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's a good question. Yeah, I don't have a really great answer, but I mean, that, yeah, that would make I sense. Mean, it's, a, it's a, you know, who could play God, right? But why would you bother with that stage if you can just go to the, you can make a transparent one like the one on the left. Right, yeah, hatch so like you a. You can't do that because of the physical changes in the. Yeah, I mean, there's this. Skeleton or something. I don't know. One of the, the older theories to think was like a R and K type species. There's one that like like uh, a lot of new shore fish species that do broadcast spawning, thousands of eggs, and you hope that one makes it to be an adult. Like tuna, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of eggs. Or there's things like us mammals, right? You put a lot of investment for one offspring at a time, but there's a good chance that one offspring is going to make it to adulthood. And so, yeah, fishes kind of have this different type of Called yeah life his, life history strategy to just put out a lot you know hedge your bets and hope that a handful of them make it to that um, adult stage but yeah really great question so, yeah. uh, I'm starting it so that's that's what the the fin clips are for so my advisor in lab is located at HIMB, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, Coconut Island. So they have the kind of hardware and materials to actually extract the DNA out of those fin clips. And then there's a kind of like a genetic database. You can kind of compare that against other species around the world. But also what would be interesting is just compare the species we're catching here around our island, but also different islands and see how that, how that varies. Oh, I, I'm doing that now. Yeah, there is one person from 
University of Minnesota, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Wallace, who has done a, a lot of um, genetic work on bonefishes throughout the world. However, her sample sizes for Hawaii and all the different islands were really low. So the idea is that, you know, I've, I forget, you know, a couple hundred samples or something like that, yeah. And this number is, is only gonna go up. So it'll be a little bit more robust of a, a sample size. Good question. And I guess if I make it to the end, when I was here in 2015, I think I showed this one. So this is what we learned from their, their diet study. The, the names on the bottom are, are generalized. They used to be all the scientific names, but then that kind of wouldn't mean much to even me. So we kind of generalized them into other things. But the idea is that the glossodonta, these are the round jaws, so the ones on the shallow flats. They're eating just a few things, but a lot of it. And then our sharp jaws that are living in the deep are kind of more of a generalist. They're eating a lot of different types of types of things. And so that's just one of the kind of interesting things that came off in the tagging project. 